Hey everybody, welcome to Taming the Shrew. Uh, today we need to do some expert commentary regarding the recent uh, STEMI flight case that we published. And uh, so with me is indeed an expert. We have Dr. Matt Chin, who is, uh, as most of you know, the resident assistant medical director of Air Care and a three-year flight doc with us now. And so Matt's going to lend us his expertise. So real quick, uh, let's review the case that we're talking about here. Uh, so this was an interhospital transfer for a STEMI. Um, and in looking at the EKG that was provided, it looks like we're dealing with a uh, pretty uh, unmissable anterolateral STEMI with huge tombstones, reciprocal depression in the inferior leads, and definitely sinus rhythm on that, uh, on that EKG. So we know we're dealing with an anterolateral STEMI, and at the outside hospital, it looks like he has, uh, the patient has received uh, aspirin, nitro with mild relief of pain, uh, IV, IV heparin bolus and drip, and some morphine for pain. And as we arrive, uh, we recognize that the patient is hemodynamically stable with really good looking vital signs, but still uh, somewhat in distress, still having pain. Uh, lungs were clear, and really nothing else of, uh, of significance on physical exam. Neurostatus seemed uh, good. Also of relevance, the patient is status post drug eluting stent, uh, I believe just a couple of weeks ago, but has been non-compliant with Plavix. So we may be dealing with a reocclusion of a uh, prior stented vessel. So without further ado, that is the case that we've got, and let's just dive right into the discussion questions that we have. So the first question is, uh, what can you do to help facilitate the movement of the patient from the outside hospital to the air care cot? What responsibilities belong to the flight doc or NP? What responsibilities belong to the flight nurse? Are there assigned roles? And also, what times do we need to uh, know and document in golden hour? So, Chin, what do you think? So, um, kind of in discussion with that, obviously, this is a team effort, so there's no specific assigned role. Although, traditionally, um, when you go to the scene, we've talked as the flight physicians or the APNs is kind of uh, moving towards putting the monitor on the patient. In this case, um, we almost we come to agreement that most all of us put the patients on defibrillator pads on arrival, and whether the those pads are already on the patient at the outside facility, and we can utilize the adapters on the Zoll monitor to use the pads there uh, to provide them less discomfort of having to remove those pads and place our pads on. Um, but traditionally, that's something that we've discussed as, a, as something the residents could do is place the patient on the monitor, put the blood pressure cuff on, put the pulse socks on, and try to facilitate that movement faster. Um, while the nurses uh, have traditionally um, gone more with the uh, medications and drips, oftentimes um, the heparin is not continued in flight, just more mainly for ex uh, expediency's sake. Um, however, um, they continue with the other medications if the patient's on a presser, if the patient's on a, some sort of drip or they're intubated or something like that and they're on a, a sedative medication or something, that's something that they are a little bit more facile with than some of us in terms of applying the GEMSTARS or the uh, triple channels, the other uh, drip monitors that we have. Um, to facilitate that. Um, and then it's obviously a team effort to get the cart or the stretcher next to the bed and transferring the patient over as safely and as quickly as possible. Um, we you know, saw some uh, quotes about be quick and but don't be in a hurry. So certainly that applies here. We want to make sure these patients get the, um, the quickest possible transfer to the facility that can provide them that definitive treatment. However, we obviously want to be do it in the safest manner as possible as that's kind of our, our you know, policy here at AirCare is to be as safe as possible for both the patient and the crews. Um, now, let me ask you, what would your physical exam be on this patient? So my physical exam is generally walk in the room, you get a talk to the patient, get a brief story or history from them in terms of why they presented the hospital. Obviously, if they're awake and able to give that, I think that gives you a good uh, insight into their uh, neurological status, where they're uh, awake, alert, and talkative, what their mental status is like, and whether they're having any issues with perfusion secondary to the to the STEMI. So I think just getting a general exam from walking in the room and having a few words with them will give you a lot of information about them. Outside of that, we're looking for listening to lungs, um, making sure there's no rails or crackles or signs of kind of um, significant heart failure associated with this 
uh, STEMI, um, doing a peripheral exam mainly for peripheral pulses, maybe taking a glance at the belly. But beyond that, I think doing a quick focused um, history and physical is what is all we do here. And ideally that happens in probably less than 60 seconds. You can get the majority of the information you need on these patients in terms of a physical exam in that kind of time period. Right on. Now, if, uh, if you arrive at this outside hospital and uh, there's a referring hospital nurse in the room, but no referring physician, how, how hard would you work to find them to get a report directly from a referring doc? So it's always helpful to get a report from the referring physician, but as you know, as I do, oftentimes they're not available. So I wouldn't spend a significant amount of time other than knowing what the interventions was and, not, and most likely the nurse is going to know as well as anyone what the interventions were. Um, the main thing that you want to make sure that you're available to either see or discuss with the physician is that EKG. So if there's not a referring physician there to give you a report in terms of what kind of STEMI this was, I think acquiring and looking at the EKG yourself, which again shouldn't take very long, um, can help you determine in later in flight, especially if there's any complications with this patient um, about what you should do at that point, whether this is an inferior MI, whether you need to be worried about kind of preload and whether this patient needs to be on fluids or whether this is a big anterior lateral MI, uh, where maybe that's less likely to be the cause, but certainly knowing the etiology of the STEMI can give you some further insight into how to treat them if you have encounter any complications later in flight. Totally agree. I, uh, I would always, before I left the hospital with that patient, I would always take the time in some way to find out what distribution of MI am I dealing with, because that's, that's going to impact the complications that I'm worried about uh, and is going to impact how I care for the patient, how judicious I am with things like uh, preload reducers like morphine and nitro. So yeah, it, it doesn't take long, but we, we got to find out what kind of MI we're dealing with. Um, now, as, as to that question of golden hour times, um, I'll address that one. We, we always need to have documented in golden hour what the door time was at the referring hospital. In other words, what time did the patient first enter the referring hospital ER? And we need to document what time was the diagnostic EKG obtained. So obviously a lot of times with a STEMI, your initial EKG is non-diagnostic, but then you get another one 15, 20 minutes later, and that one's diagnostic. So the diagnostic one is the one that we, we want to uh, document in golden hour. But uh, documenting those times is incredibly important to our ability to monitor our quality and the sort of improvement and outcomes that we're having uh, with our code STEMI care. Uh, because if we, if we know the diagnostic EKG, EKG time and we know the door time at the referring hospital, uh, then we can calculate DIDO door in, door out, uh, which is known to correlate very well with mortality and STEMI. So any final thoughts on that question before we move to question two? No, yeah, I mean, I think that about covers it. So taking, making sure you take a look at that EKG is kind of something that I've made part of my practice pattern at least is to at least glance at it if there's no one to give you a report in terms of of looking at to know your complications from those. Right on. So question two. As you move the patient to the cot, he has a V-fib arrest. I thought all these STEMI flights were just <laughs> milk runs and these patients were rock stable and these were boring flights. What the heck? Yeah, I know. Apparently, <laughs> this guy is impolite and has a V-fib arrest. So what are your priorities for the management of this patient? And what if, alternatively, he arrested in the helicopter? So first of all, there's a lot to this question that we need to discuss. But first of all, uh, give me your thoughts on if the patient is now in arrest and you have not obtained ROSC, and you may or may not obtain it in the future, but right now you don't have ROSC. What's your thought process on when you're going to go ahead and move the patient anyway versus when you're going to stay at the scene? So I think generally if you haven't left the facility and you're still either loading the patient onto your cot or they arrest in the emergency department, I think the most logical thing to do in the progression is probably to to perform that code in the hospital where you have all the resources of that outside facility and you have all the additional help because as we all know the quarters of the helicopter are not conducive to performing good CPR or good ACLS in any uh, way shape or form just secondary to the logistics of getting people up and around and having limited sets of hands. So I think in the hospital the 
the easiest answer is to obviously move the patient either off of our cot back onto their stretcher uh, and do ACLS with the help of the personnel that's available at that facility. Um, I think that applies probably up to when you're about to leave the facility and when that critical decision point is about when you decide to lift off and when you decide to go back into the facility, whether you're outside on the helipad, is up for debate. I don't know that there's a specific answer. I think my general practice pattern or my thought process would be is that if you haven't turn the rotors and you're still on the ground um, and the patient has a VFib arrest or any sort of a cardiac arrest that the easiest thing would be to move that patient back into the facility and do ACLS and do the remainder of the code in the hospital with all those resources available. I think that's probably, um, in my opinion at least, the, the safest thing to do and the easiest thing to do from a, a, a you know, hands-on standpoint that you have much more resources there than you do in the, in the helicopter. Having said that, I think if you are already, you know, obviously if you've already started spinning the rotors or you're up in the air, I think that proceeding to the, the outside hospital is certainly a reasonable um, way to go about this uh, with the idea that, you know, certainly there they're going to get the definitive care. Um, just recognizing the fact that obviously doing a performing cardiac arrest with two people in the back of a helicopter is logistically challenging and that trying to get everything done that you would normally be able to do on the ground with the additional resources is likely unable to, to happen or at least happen with the quality that you would get on the ground. So I think um, my thought process would be is that, you know, up till you've kind of uh, started spinning and lifted that, and lifted that um, you know, performing the, the cardiac arrest um, and trying to obtain ROSC while on the ground with those additional resources the way I would go with that. Yeah. If if somebody's in arrest and you haven't gotten ROSC, to just go ahead and load them and fly them anyway brings up uh, significant questions in terms of, uh, you know, financial impact to that patient and their family uh, and in terms of ethics. So in general, uh, the, the way we practice is that we don't load people without having gotten ROSC uh, with, with a few exceptions which usually include pediatric patients. Uh, but in this case I, I like following the uh, what I will heretofore uh, refer to as the CHIN algorithm which is uh, if the rotors aren't yet turning then I'm not going to make them start turning and fly away until or unless I get ROSC. Again, there's always room to individualize cases based on other factors, but I, I like that algorithm. So let's go back now to the setting where the patient is VFib arrested and we're still in the referring ER, but we've already moved the patient to our cot. Uh, so talk about, in that setting, how specifically you would manage that patient, assign roles, would you leave them on our cot, and what sorts of things would you be prioritizing to care for that patient? Sure, I think the first thing is probably just to um, kind of wrangle up enough people to get them off of our cot and back onto the stretcher. I think performing CPR on our cot, um, which is kind of mobile on four wheels um, and much smaller and less in you know less able to do kind of the functions of up and down that are generally available on a, a hospital stretcher. Um, getting them back over to that stretcher is probably the first thing to do. And after that, prioritizing roles in terms of who's going to do what. So, at, in the hospital, I would anticipate that you would have enough resources to kind of get done, uh, run a good ACLS code. Um, so you have your flight nurse who has medications, the hospital obviously has medications there, so assigning roles to both the flight nurses as, as well as the uh, nurses that are on staff there in terms of documentation. So somebody doing code documentation, doing every two minutes of, you know, CPR for pulse checks and all that kind of uh, sort of thing. Somebody pulling up medications, somebody getting IV access, the same stuff that you would normally prioritize um, when you have a code and you're running it in an emergency department with all those resources. I think that you, you know, task people to do certain things. Uh, as the physician, you can certainly um, participate in any of those things because obviously this is a, very much a team effort. Um, but, you know, managing the airway and deciding what to do with the airway and, all, and with the equipment that you have as well as the outside equipment. And then you also have a physician there. So whether they're going to be, you know, in the, in the room with you to help or whether they're going to be tending to their own patients, you know, you'll kind of have to play that by ear. But I think, um, we all have, at least by the time that, you know, most of the residents are flying, um, have, participated at least in codes in the emergency department and kind of recognize the roles that need to be um, filled and then assigning those roles to people because obviously when you specifically assign roles it tends to happen more as opposed to the nebulous somebody do this or somebody do that but actually saying hey can you please do this x person and you know other outside facility nurse can you please do this and taking care of it um, like you would any other um, cardiac arrest in your emergency department but doing that there because you have now all these resources to, to use to your advantage yeah and I, I've become really good at, uh, even though I don't know the people that are working at the referring hospital, 
uh, usually they wear name tags. And uh, so I'm quite adept at reading those name tags and calling them by name when I need them to do something. That can really be helpful as opposed to just pointing at somebody and saying, hey, you. Now, let's, we'll come back to question two, but let's address question three in the same setting of the patient is arrested and we're still in the referring ED. And question three asks us, all right, we're doing good ACLS as you've described. Does the referring hospital have anything else that might be helpful to us uh, in this case if we haven't yet gotten ROSC? And I think it was brought up uh, by multiple people posting is the the use of lytics in this case in a patient who has a known um, STEMI, who has a known lesion. I think, you know, there's been some studies looking at it, you know, for the undifferentiated cardiac arrest, but uh, as we both discussed earlier today, this is not the undifferentiated cardiac arrest. This is a patient with a drug eluting stent who probably has reinstant stenosis, who's not been on his platics, who has, a, who has a STEMI on EKG. And this patient, you know, treated in the outside facility, you know, we know from kind of pre-hospital stuff is that, you know, this patient is a is a candidate for lytics, I think, especially in the cardiac arrest setting uh, at an outside hospital where you don't have access to the cath lab and you don't have ROS yet. So I think this patient is, is the perfect candidate for whether they have tenecteplase, um, which would probably be more ideal, but whether they have alteplase or whatever other lytic they, they have there um, that you can use kind of intracode at that point um, when you're trying to throw the kitchen sink at these people, knowing what their ideology of their cardiac arrest is, that this, that this therapy is potentially beneficial to them. I totally agree. Any cardiac arrest, you know, we always uh, think about following the appropriate ACLS algorithm, and we should, and we, we do that well. The thing that sometimes I think gets unfortunately underemphasized is what is the underlying cause and what can I do about it? And this is a, a classic case where we know uh, with essentially no doubt what the underlying cause is. And there's one thing that is screaming at us that we can do about it. Uh, because if we're in a referring emergency department that does not have a cath lab, they, they've got to have some kind of thrombolytic. It may be TPA, it may be RPA, it may be tenecteplase, but somewhere in that hospital, they've got a lytic. Soon, I think that we will be carrying our own, but for the current time being, we don't. Uh, and I think this would be a perfect case for us to uh, borrow one from the referring hospital and administer it. Because if, as we've already decided, if we don't get ROSC on this patient, then we're going to be pronouncing them there and not transporting them. So when, when that's your other option, why not give it a shot when you know that the underlying cause of this arrest was a STEMI? So I totally agree with you. A couple other things that the referring hospital may have that you may not, uh, depending on which aircraft you're on, you may not have ultrasound and the referring hospital may or may not, but if they do, then as with pretty much any code that we run these days in the SRU, I would be using ultrasound to help me. That could, uh, that could rule out a big pericardial effusion or pericardial tamponade, uh, which is usually more of a delayed complication of an MI. But if a patient happens to have like a, uh, you know, a ruptured ventricle related to their infarct, then obviously they could get a cardiac tamponade from that. And you would hate to miss that and not pericardiosentis uh, that patient when potentially you could have done something about it. Um, in rare instances, that referring hospital might also have either a Lucas or an Autopulse device. And if you happen to see one of those hanging on the wall in their uh, recess bay there, that would uh, probably simplify things as opposed to uh, just doing manual CPR. So if they happen to have that, I would use that. And I guess the, the other life-saving thing that they have, uh, if we do get ROSC, would be ICE. Uh, because if we do get ROSC on this patient, then we should be thinking about targeted temperature management, should we not? Yeah, I mean, I can completely agree. It's, um, you know, it's one of the things that we've, uh, especially at this institution, focused on is targeted temperature management um, and, you know, administering just the starting the process in the helicopter, I think, can certainly be beneficial to the patient, especially, you know, in particular when they're going to a facility that obviously will continue that targeted temperature management, such as this facility, um, that initiating that, 
you know, in our aircraft, which is probably a lot different than just just regular pre-hospital administration of post cardiac arrest, where there's been some questionable evidence. But I think in our case, uh, our aircraft is equipped similar to an intensive care unit, and we're providing kind of reaching out with that that expert medical care, and that's certainly something we can provide to the patients, um, hopefully for their benefit, is targeted temperature management and at least administering that in the outside facility or beginning that in the outside facility to hopefully continue that on throughout their course. Right on. So. Uh, in the very near future, we will be carrying esophageal uh, uh, temperature monitoring probes and we'll be carrying cold saline. Uh, but for the current time being, if you get this case tomorrow and you get ROSC and the patient is not following commands, uh, and assuming that you're going to a hospital, as pretty much any hospital with a cath lab that you would be going to, uh, would be continuing targeted temperature management then yeah, we ought to get some some ice on board in the groin and the axilla, expose the patient, and uh, turn up the air conditioning in, in the aircraft to uh, initiate uh, at least the avoidance of hyperthermia, if not actually cooling them down. Now let's switch gears for a minute and talk about if this arrest had occurred after we already had the patient loaded and had the rotors turn in. And so now we're talking about the specter of running a code in the helicopter with just you and your partner and nobody else. So how does that change things compared to the scenario that we described about running a code in the referring ER? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we talked about it earlier that it's logistically challenging to perform um, quality CPR and quality ACLS in the back of a helicopter with four hands and two people. Um, I think that, you know, the the dimensions of the aircraft are not permissive to that. The um, kind of getting up and out of your seat, which is something you would need to talk to the pilot, at least advise them that, that both of the crew members are likely to be out of their seat during this process. Um, but trying to perform CPR, you've essentially tied up one person with doing CPR. Um, and then you're trying to do the rest of the ACLS algorithm. So you're, you know, trying to do some sort of airway. And whether you do a superglottic device with an eye gel or a king airway, just simply for resource management and trying to play something quick, or whether you try to intubate them, I don't know that there's a, a right answer to that question, but certainly trying to make sure you utilize your resources to get as much done in as quick of a time as possible. Um, so performing some sort of airway and then uh, medications. I think, you know, thinking back about the, the efficacy of um, epinephrine or vasopressin or any of those kind of uh, ACLS medications, I think we both would probably prioritize um, in airway and doing C good quality CPR um, as opposed to potentially the medications as there's always been some question about whether they're efficacious anyways. But, uh, and then trying to finish, trying to be um, efficient and being able to do other stuff other than just managing an airway. So you could potentially bag without mask this patient. However, it really ties up one person doing the airway and one person doing CPR. So I think a superglottic device or an intubation helps you a little bit in that if you can transition them to the vent, it allows at least one person to have a free set of hands to do something else, whether that is to draw up drugs or to get access, additional access or to whatever it is, to talk on the radio to get a report to the receiving institution who would probably like to know that the patient they're currently getting is in cardiac arrest, which yeah. may change where you go and um, from the helipad. Um, so I think trying to be as um, smooth with it as possible with the resources that you have and trying to free up as much as you can and letting um, the equipment we have do what it's supposed to do um, to its best ability to allow you to do other things is probably you know what you should try to do so it's having somebody do CPR trying to get them with an airway put them on the vent and then trying to do medications making sure you can give report to the receiving facility all those kinds of things um, but again is it going to be perfect or is it going to be like you do in you know in, in the trauma resuscitation bay when you have all those hands it's not going to be and I don't think that you should certainly expect that it's going to be run exactly the same or um, I think the expectation is that you just are going to do your best to use the resources you have and the equipment you have to, to try to provide the best care for your patient during the time that you have them in the aircraft knowing that um, you're likely going to be limited in some of your interventions. Yeah. I always joke around that you can play Nerf basketball in the back of the EC-145 because it's so luxuriously big. But uh, my analogy stops holding up when you're talking about doing CPR. Uh, even the EC-145, it's really difficult to do good CPR. That being said, doing good CPR is one of the most important things to do uh, in a cardiac arrest that occurs in the helicopter. And so we've got to give it our best shot. And uh, if we're talking about a flight of more than a few minutes, we're going to need to switch off to be able to uh, avoid fatigue and do it well. 
Um, and we can certainly do it better than a lot of smaller EMS helicopters that are out there flying, but it's still not going to be as good a quality as it is in an emergency department somewhere. So we just got to recognize that limitation. Um, yeah. Okay. Now let's move on to question number four. So let's say we're back in the ER and we ran this code. Maybe we gave lytics and we did get ROSC. All right, so uh, we're back to a patient with uh, spontaneous circulation and we've addressed targeted temperature management. And at this point, uh, we've got a patient with a blood pressure of 60 over 30, but a palpable pulse. And the referring doc is now uh, materialized and is saying, okay, there's the door, see ya. I would like you to move on now. Uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think Trying to, we would all love to have a pretty blood pressure when we leave and have no issues in flight and, and you know, take an uncomplicated semi to another hospital, but that's simply not the case. And I think, you know, even talking about what what's the definitive care that we're supposed to provide for these patients, and that's getting that vessel open. And that's not at the facility, obviously, you're leaving from. So that's at a receiving facility. So getting that patient to that facility to receive that definitive treatment um, in a kind of uh, timely fashion, because that does affect the morbidity and mortality of these patients is how long it takes for them to get that uh, vessel open. So getting to, to that facility is the priority. Now, you know, again, we would all like to have them with some pretty numbers before we leave, but the fact is, is that you have a pulse now and you want them to have definitive care. Uh, and we've talked, you know, extensively about the fact that we certainly don't run run a cardiac arrest in the back of the helicopter, but at the same time, you have a pulse now. Um, we have the ability to provide pressures to those patients, both whether it's in the hospital or in the aircraft. We have the ability to do, um, you know, um, leave a fed or other pressors in the, in the aircraft as well that's similar to what you'd be able to do there so I think if you have a pulse yeah you'd like to get them a little bit prettier but you have to understand and know that the definitive care is available at the outside facility so you know it's not necessarily unreasonable for the outside facility to want you to take the, the patient that's why they called you and that's why you're there is to provide that critical care for those unstable patients you know um, we're not there just to transport the the very well to other facilities we're there to transport the very sick to facilities and that's why um, you know and the case of air care, we try to provide the, the most well-trained physicians and nurse practitioners and flight nurses and uh, everybody is that, is that we can provide that care when that patient needs it most and we can do that in the air. Um, and then, you know, that's the reason we fly over there. So if you've got a post-arrest patient and you've done everything and you've, you know, applied target temperature management and you've got, and you've got them stabilized at least somewhat, uh, getting them to that uh, definitive care center or getting them to that cath lab is probably a reasonable expectation from the outside facility. And I think a reasonable expectation from us is that we should be able we can manage that patient in flight with pressors and whether that's push those pressors or starting drips or, or whatever it is we have all those resources in them in the medication uh, bags that we carry well said yeah i also did not blame the referring facility for wanting us to leave immediately once we got rosk uh, from a human factor standpoint uh first of all People always talk about a dichotomy of stay and play versus load and go. And uh, a lot of people have brought up, and I agree, that that's kind of a false dichotomy. You know, it's not one or the other. You're always, you're always trying to move the patient to definitive care, and you're always trying to do as much as you can while you are facilitating that movement to stabilize the patient while you're on the way. And it's to simply say that it's one or the other is, is not true. But in a case like this, I would ask myself, now that I've got ROSC on the STEMI patient who arrested, what do they need most? And what they need most is that artery opened up. So uh, as Matt said, we can do a lot to stabilize that patient in flight. Uh, but we are not moving them toward getting that artery opened up while we're standing in the referring hospital. And so to, to stick around and do things like put in an art line or a central line, I feel like would be risk greater than benefit in this case. You know, we can get additional access quicker than that in route, either by a peripheral IV or an IO if we need additional points of access. Uh, and we can add pressors, we can add inotropes, but, uh, what they need most is that artery opened up. Now, a lot of times people bring up this concept that in my mind is pretty mythical, which is too unstable for transport. 
in my mind, too unstable to transport is pulseless. And otherwise, if you've got spontaneous circulation, then I think transporting unstable patients is what we do. And if they're not unstable, then they don't need us. So I think this worrying too much, is this patient too unstable to transport, is not a useful worry to have. If they've got a pulse, I'm going to have your back if you decide to go ahead and load them onto the helicopter and go with them. Now, if we're talking about a, a patient who was, say, in undifferentiated shock, and there was very little idea of what was going on with the patient, and we did not know of any specific time-dependent definitive intervention that was awaiting them at the accepting hospital. In that case, I might well spend some extra time at the referring hospital, taking additional time to figure out what the heck is going on here, and what can I do to stabilize it before leaving. But once I know that there is a time-dependent definitive intervention that the patient can only receive somewhere else other than where I am, then I am very likely to agree with this referring doc and get the heck out of there. So, well said. Um, and thanks to everybody who commented. There were some really, uh, you know, world-class comments that were thrown down both by our own team and a lot of outside uh critical care transport providers who uh, threw in their expertise from uh, all around the states. Uh, and uh, I thought that was really cool to see. One final point that I wanted to discuss real quick is what the code STEMI protocol is or what that means to air care. Um, Chin, what does it mean to you? And just a quick summary. Sure, I mean, I think it means our ability to provide the quickest and safest uh, transport to a definitive care facility. So, you know, getting that patient an out, from an outside facility that doesn't have the, um, you know, the cardiac catheter lab allowing us to be that in between for providing that critical care for that patient during the transport and trying to get them there as fast as possible to receive that definitive care. Yeah, excellent. Well said. So, Trying to put, trying to get that down to brass tacks. It, it's uh, what that means to say our customers, the the referring hospitals who call us. Uh, one, it means that as soon as they've got a diagnostic EKG with a STEMI, they can call us and activate us before they even know where that patient's going to go. They they no longer have to work out who the who the accepting hospital or the accepting physician is going to be in order to get us moving toward that patient. Um, Secondly, it means that we are not going to spend the time to transfer over drips that are just going to be discontinued as soon as that patient hits the cath lab anyway. So with code STEMI cases, we don't continue nitro drips, we don't continue heparin drips, we don't continue, continue integralin drips. If, on the other hand, the patient is on an antiarrhythmic because of a prior, say, uh, run of VTAC that they had, then we should continue the amiodarone. If the patient's on a presser and they still seem to need it, we'll continue the presser. Uh, but otherwise, heparin, nitro, integralin, we're not going to waste the time uh, to continue those drips. Um, so those are the main aspects of, of what code STEMI means in brass tacks. Uh, we also, uh, when possible and safe to do so, uh, we encourage both hot loads and hot unloads, realizing that a lot of the time, uh, that's not going to be possible or is not going to be felt to be safe. Uh, but when it is, then that can save another couple of minutes as well. And, uh, you know, minutes is uh, tens of thousands of viable myocardial cells. And so that can make a difference to patients for their future ejection fraction. Um, now, the final thing that occasionally comes up in code STEMI is we get activated in, a, in an instance where the referring doc doesn't yet know where the patient is going to go. They don't yet have an accepting hospital or an accepting doc. And we get there and we examine the patient and we get them packaged and we're now ready to go out the door. And the referring doc says, hold on, I still don't have an accepting doc. I've been trying to call Dr. X at, uh, you know, uh, St. whatever hospital and they won't call me back. So what do we do in that case? Um, I think, you know, we can try to facilitate that as best we can, but um, I'll defer to Dr. Hinckley for more specifics on that. So you've never uh, never encountered this, <laughs> which, which is good, and probably all of you will not encounter this either. Uh, but it is possible, and I want to make sure that we've talked about it. So 
In that case, we have default acceptance of any STEMI patients here at University Hospital. Um, and uh, so the cath lab here, whoever the interventionalist is here, will accept the patient. You know, it doesn't matter where the patient is from or what their insurance is, they'll take them. And so that is something that we can offer to the referring doc and to the patients who then have the right to accept that offer or decline it as they see fit. Um, so uh, in such a case, I would, if, if, you know, they can't get Dr. X that they usually use at St. X Hospital to call back, I would certainly offer them that option and encourage them to use it. But if either the referring doc or the patient says, no, I want to wait more time for Dr. X to call back, we have to defer to them. Otherwise, we're, we're screwing with Intala liability. Uh, but, but that is the offer that we have. And if we need it, uh, pretty much always people will accept that offer. And then what we would need to do is call for a men, our medical control doc, and say, uh, activate the cath lab at university, let the interventional attendee know that we're bringing them a STEMI. And we can probably then work out, you know, uh, direct uh, straight to the cath lab as opposed to having to bring the patient to the ER or something else. Cool. All right. Any any last minute thoughts? Wisdom? I mean, I think we always, uh, you know, do what's best for the patient and what's the safest. So what's the safest way to do this? And, and in the end, what is the best thing to do for the patient? That's always a thing to keep in mind when we do any of the transports. This is STEMI or anything else um, for all the practitioners that, that work here. I think that's certainly a, a driving force behind everything that we do. Hell yes. Awesome. Chen, thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in, for all your comments, and we'll see you next time. Adios.